What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Bronx Pinstripe Show. Today, I'm joined by Neil Keefe filling in for Scott, who's still gallivanting around Italy, eating pasta, drinking wine, while the Yankees are just spiraling down the toilet. Neil's always fun to talk to, as you guys may be familiar with him. He's a realistic Yankees fan. Some may call him negative, but I think right now with how the team is going, definitely uh, a lot of just cold hard facts that you cannot ignore with this team. We recap the Tampa series, um, three positives and negatives, mostly negatives. Talk about Juan Soto, talk about Aaron Judge's missed opportunities in Thursday's game, venting about Aaron Boone and, and the rest of the coaching staff and the front office. Got a lot off our chest in this episode. So stay tuned for that. Scott will be back for our next episode, which will be recapping the Baltimore series right before the All-Star break. And then also during the All-Star break, we're going to be recording our midseason GM episode where Scott and I each have our plans on how we would fix this team. It, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's going to be a complete teardown. Or maybe I'll just say, do nothing and fire everyone. You have to tune in to find out. Before we get to the episode, though, we're brought to you today, today by Factor Meals. Summer is the perfect time to eat healthy and reach your wellness goals, and there's no better way to do that than with Factor Meals. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes, so no matter how busy you are, you can eat healthy and have great-tasting food. The process is very easy. You just go on their website and choose from over 35 delicious meals each week. You can also customize your deliveries with 60 different add-ons. Highly skilled chefs prepare your food and it's delivered to you. Heating the meals heating the meals up takes just two minutes, as I said. And my personal favorite part, there's no mess or anything to clean up because there's... I don't mind the cooking process. It's the cleanup process that is super frustrating. But with Factor, you get delicious food with no mess to clean up. Every meal, they have every meal offered from breakfast to dessert, so you have so many options to choose from. Factor is no prep, no mess, just delicious food. We've got a new offer for you. Head to factormeals.com slash bronx50 and use code bronx50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That is awesome, an amazing deal that you do not want to miss. 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month after that at factormeals.com slash bronx50. Let's get into the episode. Joining me on the podcast is Neil Keefe, Keefe to the city. We did a little bit of a home and home this week. I was on your show a couple of days ago. Uh, it was, as you can imagine, a pretty negative 30 minutes of baseball talk. And I don't know what <laughs> real, this is going to be. A pretty realistic <laughs> view of baseball talk is how I'll call it. Yeah, realistic view. We're recapping the Tampa series, which, hey, they won a game. That's something. They actually won a game. They didn't get swept. There you go. They didn't get swept. Um, they did their best to. I mean, Clay Holmes did everything he could to try to get them swept, but Trent Grisham just wouldn't have it. Yeah, I mean, is that would that have been Clay Holmes' fault, or would that have been Tommy Canley for putting a couple guys on and then Clay Holmes coming into a spot? Because you're right, that's a rocket to right center field, and uh, Grisham made a nice play. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a couple inches away from two runs scoring, and then they're going to lose. But, I mean, yeah, Tommy Canley can't be trusted. He he hasn't been able to be trusted since he threw 26 straight change-ups in the <laughs> ALCS uh, seven years ago. But Clay Holmes, I mean, He's been like, on two different teams since then, Neil. Come on. I mean, do you trust Tommy Canley? Of course not. I don't trust anyone in the bullpen. If you, if you, throw, if you come into a game and you throw eight change-ups in a row, what, is the, what are you changing it up from? Nothing. <laughs> So well, your, your changeup is your fastball, and that seems to be his idea. And the Yankees do operate under this idea. Like, if you do something great as a pitcher, if you have a great pitch, just throw that pitch. Yeah. But the reason those pitches are great is because they're coming off of something else. Like, if you have a great slider, but you only throw the slider, what is it sliding off of? Nothing. <laughs> just that You'll just learn it eventually. But Clay Holmes, I mean, yeah, he comes into a game. He's, the ball's going to be put in play. When you have a closer that can't strike anyone out, and balls go in play, bad things happen, and the Yankees are very lucky a bad thing didn't happen uh, in the second game of the series. Well, do you think Astros fans were saying that about Lance McCullers Jr. when he threw 28 straight curveballs to the Yankees in 2017? No, because they couldn't hit a curveball. So hit a curveball. Yeah, out. Like, he just didn't even, wasn't even getting signs, just throwing it in there. The only the only pitcher I can remember for the Yankees that I was legitimately like just throw your curveball was Dellen Batances. Yeah, I mean, peak Dellen was 
unbelievable. Like it was insane when when someone would get a hit off of him. Um, yeah, I agree. He, he was the only guy that, you know, you go back a long time, and he's the only guy that you could trust to do it over and over. Um, I miss I miss peak Dallin Betances. He would be really good for this team. As long as he was pitching in the seventh or the eighth inning, not the ninth inning, as <laughs> Randy Levine told us. He's he's not a closer. He's not a closer, Neil. No, he's not. Oh, good old Randy. <laughs> Good old Randy. All right, so we do three positives and three negatives from every series. Honestly, it's impossible to find three positives from this Tampa series. One that I did want to call out was, even though you just mentioned Clay Holmes did his best to try and not save that game on Wednesday, he did. He got a four-out save. I thought there was no chance. When he's coming in with two runners on for a four-out save, I thought there's a 0% chance the Yankees are winning this game. But they won the game, and that is a positive. But Michael Kay, the next day, just like so desperate for anything to turn this around, is talking about how this was so huge. The Yankees held a, a one-run lead for four innings or whatever it was. Like, this, is, this can be the turnaround. And immediately you just realize that it's not. It's not because the, to think that like, – one two to one eked out win over the crappy Rays is going to turn your season around when it's just not. I mean, they haven't won back to back games in a month since the Kansas City series a month ago. They haven't won a series since then. Haven't won eight straight series. They're going to need to do a lot more than barely get by the Rays to for me to think, oh, they're going to come out of this. And even if they go to Baltimore and they and they win on Friday night on Saturday, you're going to think, oh, that was the start of something. No, and they're probably not going to win in Baltimore because. The Orioles just got swept by the Cubs, got outscored 21-2 to in the three games, and got shut out the last two games. So if you believe in do, the Orioles are going to put up like 30 runs this weekend against the Yankees. Do you believe in do, or do you believe in, oh, and maybe you're running into a cold Baltimore team? No, I believe in do. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe I, in I, Anthony Santander a rhetorical question. putting a three-run bomb into Utah Street in the first inning tonight. Yeah, I, it was a rhetorical question. <laughs> All right, the next positive, let me see if you agree with this one. Austin Wells looks a little bit better at the plate. Yeah, I mean, I'm an Austin Wells fan, and he's looked really bad at times this year, but he also isn't used to playing so sporadically. So it kind of comes with the territory. If you're only going to play him, you know, for the most of the season, he's played half the time at most. And for a guy who's used to playing the majority of the week, that's just a really big change to make. Jose Trevino, we know what he is. He's not very good. He's not very good at hitting. He's not great at – he's the worst at throwing base runners out. He's good at framing. Mm -hmm. So he's good at this magical, mystical stat. That's it. I, I'm done watching Jose Trevino play baseball. Play Austin Wells. At least, you know, you're going to make – you know, even if you think Trevino's much better than him on defense, you give that up because they need the offense. And Austin Wells' is bat is worth putting in the lineup over Trevino. So, yeah – he has looked better of late because he's now playing more. And the more he plays, the better he's going to be. Kind of crazy how that happens. Which makes it all the more ridiculous that he gets pinch hit for in the eighth inning for Jose Trevino clean. just because of a, a lefty-righty match matchup. Yes. Can we stop with that? Can we stop with the nonsense? Like, uh, I, I know we're never going to stop with it, but it's just it's infuriating. Like, Jose Trevino always pinch hits for Austin Wells. Austin Wells has rarely ever, maybe I can think of like two times, maybe. There was actually an instance earlier this year. Logan and I were talking about it. I don't remember the exact game, but there was a period earlier in the season where Austin Wells was just god awful at the plate. Yeah. And Jose Trevino was actually like on a little bit of a, a streak. Remember his OPS crept up like above Volpe's for, for a couple games? Oh, wow. When Volpe was on the way down, Trevino was briefly on the way up. Regardless, he was on a hot streak for Jose Trevino, and he got pinch hit for late in a game. And I remember talking to Scott. It's like, Austin Wells sucks. Jose Trevino is also sucks, but at least he's hitting hot right now just go with the hot hand like there should be no when you're talking about austin wells jose trevino oswaldo cabrera jamai jones no, whoever other than juan soto and aaron judge who's never going to get pinch hit for everyone else in the lineup it should just be who's hotter and that's who you're going with throw Whoa. the fucking matchups out the window matchups don't matter when you're jose trevino they don't Hot streaks aren't a real thing, Andrew, if you have never heard the Yankees talk before. I remember like six years ago, I want to say five or six years ago, we were doing a podcast and we talked about that. And you said, 
baseball is literally a collection of hot and cold streaks, and I'll never forget that line. And but the Yankees don't believe in that, so you know they, they just they're just gonna play the matchups, even if the sample size is three at bats or three hundred. It doesn't matter to them, lefty righty. They're always gonna make a move. Doesn't it seem like though they don't believe it when it comes to offensive, like the offensive side of the game, but then like the pitching side of the game when. Aaron Boone stuck with Luis Hill late in the Red Sox game. He's like, well, I wanted to go with my guy. That's essentially the same thing as a hot streak for a pitcher. It's like, what's the difference? It's just one's throwing a baseball versus hitting a baseball. Right. Like the, the, the pecking order in the bullpen is completely based off of Boone's, you know, either relationship with the pitcher, his trust factor. Like Caleb Ferguson hasn't deserved to pitch in a big spot in a month, and he finally hasn't. But the there wasn't anything that like set that over. He hasn't deserved that for a long time. Finally, Boone is like in his gut thinking, I need to change that. Do you know what I think the bullpen pecking order is actually based on? It's the stupid bullpen budget graphic that the Yes Network makes. And I feel like that is how they approach bullpen decisions in games. It's like, who threw the most pitches in the last 48 hours? Well, I can't go to that guy. I got to go with the guy who's thrown the least pitches in the last 48 hours because he's going to be the most fresh. Let's run out freaking Caleb Ferguson or, or Weaver or whatever other bum. Calling Weaver a bum is, is maybe a little unfair. But you know what I'm saying. It's just like whoever has thrown – had the least amount of workload this week, that's who I'm going to go with in the big spot. 100%. They, they live and die by the – the budget, which is uh, very, you know, re- like far removed, but not that far removed from what the Jabba rules were. Like, that's what created this mess. And they're still living off of that to some degree where you can't pitch three days in a row. There's a certain amount of pitches. There's a certain amount of outs. It's just at this point of the season, like there's there's not that many games left. Everyone's thinking, oh, it's the halfway point of the All-Star break. The All-Star break is much more than the halfway point now. They're spiraling out of control. They've lost what is it now uh 18 out of 25 like big dis- like guys who have thrown two days in a row this say you know you're coming into sunday night or sunday against orioles and clay holmes is thrown on friday and saturday tough shit dude you have to throw on sunday like these games are oh, but then he can't pitch in the all-star game neil oh, he yeah, can't that's... blow the all-star game on tuesday if he pitches he... three days in a row i i am very eager to see boone's decision making this weekend knowing that they're going to be off monday to thursday like he needs to be managing on an urgent level that he's never had to really before because he never will he'll just he just believes in the way he does things and if they run out of time and they run out of games that's well it's a long haul it's a long season it's just a long season (laughs) you know a fun a fun little fact about the Jabba rules uh i know i know how you feel about andy martino but but in his book um that uh that he just uh, published he talked about that the Jabba rules were really joe torrey rules because the Yankees front office did not trust the way Joe Torre managed the bullpen, which is fair. I mean, look at Scott Proctor and, and Quantrill and these other guys who just completely got fried because Joe Torre only trusted certain guys. So they made the Jabba rules not as much it, as much of it was to manage Jabba's workload as it was to make sure Joe Torre does not overuse him and, and break him. And then what ended up happening was they broke him just in a different way. So, like, who's right, who's wrong? <laughs> Who the hell knows? But those are I the mean, Joe Torre to rules. To Joe Torre's credit, like, yeah, he would overuse guys. The, the shit he was given to work with was, you know, you know why he was overusing guys. Those those bullpens were so oh, top. The, like, the bullpens in the mid isn't good. Period. Yeah, you know, you have a lot of B guys. He had like the ultimate A plus guy. Then he would get like a B setup guy from here to there, and then just absolute garbage. So he had to do what he had to do to get by. It's honestly amazing that the Yankees won so many games in the 2002 to 2007 time frame with the pitching staff overall that they had. Yeah. Their their starting rotations were like just trash heap piles. Like Ching-Ming Wong was their ace for a long time. And their bullpen had the greatest ever and then nothing. I always think back to the 2006 team that was just – their lineup was a joke. You know, Cano was batting 342, hitting ninth. They won that game one against Detroit, destroyed them. Everyone, I remember leaving the stadium, everyone's chanting, sweep, sweep. But it was like, okay, they used Wong, and they won. And then they had Messina, who, you know, obviously didn't pitch well because he didn't seem to pitch well, you know, a lot of times in big spots. Um, And then, you know, they had Jarrett Wright and Randy Johnson, and it was a disaster. And, like, people think, oh, how did that team not win? It's very easy to see how they didn't win. The, The rotation was a joke. 
you had Farnsworth setting up Mariano, and like he, he was not very good. And uh, you know, yeah, those those mid two thousands teams left a lot of potential championships on the table based on their pitching. In that series, they also had Gary Sheffield playing first base. They did because they had to because they had Abreu and they had Matsui and they had Giambi and like Damon Jeter, A Rod, Posada, Cano. The team was insane. The lineup was insane. Yeah, do you remember in the pregame press conference, Joe Torre was asked about the lineup, and he hold, held up a piece of paper and just said, I could turn it upside down? Dude, like, yeah. I vividly yeah. remember him doing that. He basically did when he batted A-Rod 8th in the last game of the season that year. Mm, that also didn't go over well. <laughs> All right, so those are the two positives. I know we said three. So the third positive is, I guess, it wasn't a four-game series, and then they could have lost three out of four. I don't know. There's no there's no three positives, no matter how we spin this. <laughs> Let's talk about the negatives. The Yankees continue to just lose the game thanks to their starting pitching in the first inning. Carlos Rodon, four runs allowed in the first inning. Nestor Cortez. That start, by the way, to Thursday's game was an all-timer. You get second and third no outs for Judge, uh, then Rice and Glaber, and you get fly out, which wasn't deep enough to score a run, strike out, strike out. You come back, Nestor Cortez goes out there, gives up what should have been a leadoff home run. It's just off a catwalk, and I guess no camera caught it, so they call it a double. And then immediate two-run home run. I know the Yankees almost came back last night, but that game is over right there. Bottom of the first inning, 2 nothing. after yeah. you didn't play any runs and you give up a two-run bomb. That's it. That's the game. I knew they were losing that game right there. So Verdugo gets on Soto doubles at second and third, and then Judge comes up and he hits a fly ball. And while the ball was in the air, I left the room, and I was like, okay, one nothing. And then it came back, and it said second and third, one out, but I didn't look at the score. So I was like, I was like, what happened? I was like, did did Judge like did somebody walk? Then there was a, a pass, a stolen base, a pass. I was thinking like, how did they get second and third again in the ten seconds I was gone? And then I looked, and I'm like, it's zero zero. I was like. They didn't that guy, they didn't score on that fly ball. And yeah. I didn't go back and look to see how far it was, but like once Judge put it in the air, I like left to get a drink or something. And then I was stunned. And then of course I left the room again. I come back, they're down two nothing. I was like, okay, that, there, there goes that game. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't I don't know why they didn't test Verdugo ran like halfway down the line and then and then went back. It was I don't know. You've seen also like their their base their base coaching. Like their third base coach sometimes is aggressive, like sending Stanton on things. Who's basically just doing a, a light jog around the bases, and then you don't try and play to run in the first inning with uh, when you're desperate for any runs. Yeah, it makes no sense. Um, but Carlos Rodon, he continues to kill the just absolutely kill this team. Um, the four runs allowed. I talked about this on the last episode with Max Goodman, but his seemingly. Um, like not willingness uh, to go off of it, like just use his other pitches early in the game. He seems to just be very fastball focused early in the game. And Tampa was just sitting all over it. Like the, the Paredes ball, like it wasn't even a bad pitch. He was just sitting fastball. He got a fastball. No matter where that ball was going to go, he was going to hit a rocket. And he did. And it's just, it seems like Carlos Rodon is just so stubborn. I'm going to throw my fastball. I'm going to throw my fastball. This is how I get people out. And he's not getting anybody out. We're almost back to how bad he was last year. Like his numbers, when you look at them, are now at 4.63 ERA, 4.67 FIP, 1.26 WHIP, and he's allowed 19 home runs in 103 innings pitched. It's not quite as bad as last year, but it's basically as bad as last year. It's as bad as last year because the last year when he was just completely awful like he didn't come back till the halfway point by then the season was almost over and then pretty much from right after the all-star break through the rest of the season the games were meaningless and he was being bad in those meaningless games so it was like who cares now he's being bad in games that matter a lot and you know he's lost his last four starts he's put 40 run 41 base runners on in the last 19 innings got a 1089 era he, he makes, you know, $800,000 a start, and his starts are over four batters into the game. It's crazy. The uh, This is this is trending. Is this trending to be Cashman's worst free agent signing of all time? Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, uh, we got $162 million. Who's up, who's up there, though? Like, Ellsbury's up there. People yeah, always Ellsbury point to Carl Pavano, that. but Carl Pavano was a $40 million contract. $39.5 million contract. It honestly... It, 
it like irks me when people bring up Pavano as being a bad. Pavano is thirty nine point nine five million dollars. That's one and a half years of Rodon. Like that's that's nothing. Like, nothing. That was that was like couch change for the Yankees to blow. They're they paying Hicks more money to go away. They're paying. They bought had to buy out Donaldson. They paid Burnett to go away. They paid A Rod to go away. Ellsbury. They're gonna have to buy. A, they're gonna have to pay a buyout to Rizzo. Those like. The Pavano deal, yeah, it was really bad. But they were also fighting like ten other teams for him in free agency that year. Everyone wanted him. Forty million, third, not even forty million dollars is nothing. It's a joke. And, and he was mad it like, wasn't oh, forty yeah. million. You know that yeah, story? Nothing. What's that? Do you know the Pavano story where he was mad it was thirty nine point nine million or whatever, and not forty million? <laughs> Maybe that's why he sat all the time. No, because his agent, or there was just, his, there was at some point a conversation with him where it was a $40 million contract, probably because someone was like, oh, $39.9 million. That's basically $40 million. And then when he actually saw the contract and it was like 39 point something, he got all pissed off. <laughs> well, that's pretty funny. But, I mean, his... hey, he was – don't don't badmouth the 2007 opening day starter. I was there. I was there for that. So, he uh, – yeah, I mean, he, he was not good. He was hurt all the time. But that's – I mean, Keigawa's deal was oh. was like twenty something. So like, <laughs> but he was a very expensive Trenton Thunder. Like, come on, <laughs> yeah, the so dude like... traveled from Manhattan. He lived in Manhattan on the Upper East Side and had a private like car take him to Trenton every single day. <laughs> I mean, you know, those are bad deals. But the Rodon won one hundred and sixty two million dollars. You haven't gotten anything out of the guy. Anything Nothing. like he? Had no, good... you've actually gotten. Negative, like full negative. If he was just injured for the past season and a half, that would have been more positive than what he's given you. Right. And it's not like he's a likable guy and you're like, oh, I no. feel bad for this guy. He's, he's, he's a jerk. Like, he, he blew a kiss to the fans last year. He turned his back on Matt Blake. He gave up eight runs without getting it out in his last start last year. When he had to sit out, when he got hurt in spring training last year and then he couldn't pitch, he said, oh, if this was the ALDS, I'd be taking the ball. Well, no, you wouldn't because then you miss three months after that. So how are you going to take the ball if you can't pitch for three months? He just, you know, he's he's not an, a person to, that's easy to root for, which makes it even worse. So, you know, it's it's a disaster. I mean, you're thinking when you give him a six-year deal, you're thinking, okay, the back end of this is probably going to not be great. And you're already going to be through the first two years and you haven't gotten anything. So now, the you know, the first third of the deal is over and you're banking on the, probably the last third being awful. So... <clears throat> So I don't know how you're going to salvage the rest of it. No, what it, what's going to happen is he's he's going to be awful. He'll probably go down with like a catastrophic injury at some point in the middle of the contract, <laughs> and then he'll come back for year six and pitch great for yeah. for a new contract. And then he'll get, but then they'll say like, oh, we can't do this again. And then he'll go somewhere else and get a two year deal and and probably face them in the playoffs and shove it up their ass. That, mm -hmm. That's probably what will happen. He'll sign a two-year deal and be another Lance Lynn, where he turns into, like, for a brief period of time, a top-five right. pitcher in, in the American League. I mean, that, that but, would be the least surprising thing ever. You don't give him credit for gutting through games after he gives up the game in the first – after the game's effectively over at 7, 10 p.m., he guts through it. He settles in and he guts through it. I mean, yeah, he gives you five innings. Seven run ball, five innings, but at least he got you through five. He he. I love people always oh, save the bullpen. Well, save them for what? We're gonna do this thing. <laughs> we're gonna do the same thing again the next night when the next shitty starting pitcher gets the ball. So, I mean, just to hear you know after every Rodon start that he had missed a couple pitches, he had good stuff. On on Thursday night, Nestor Cortez give can't he need ninety seven pitches to get through four and a third innings. He gave up five runs, ten base runners in four and a third innings. Boone says the first thing out of his mouth after the game is stuff wise he was good, and then, <laughs> and then Jeff Nelson they cut back to the post game show and Jeff Nelson goes how are you going to sit there and tell us his stuff was good when he put when he gives up five runs ninety seven pitches in four and a third innings like, every, I know everyone realizes Boone is just an idiot but, I mean to have your own post game show and like colleagues who played with you know played with you in the league calling you out it's just a bad look. The stuff wise, it's not good. Do you know how that good stuff yesterday? Paul Skeens, he threw seven no hit innings and had eleven strikeouts. <laughs> Having good stuff, giving up yeah. five runs and four and a third is not good stuff. That's why I think everyone hates Boone. It's because when the team is just shitting all over themselves, he's still gonna try and find the positives. And I'm sorry, 
That's just not what we want to hear. And at now in year seven of Aaron Boone, I think we have enough sample to know that does not motivate the team. That does not get this group of players to play well. That's why they've had three five and 15 stretches in each of the last three seasons. They don't snap out of funks quickly under Aaron Boone because of the mentality of my starter goes out there and loses it in the first inning, but I'm going to sit here and tell you he had good stuff. It's complete asset. I'm not, and I know he's never going to sit there and say Nestor sucked tonight, but you don't have to just tell it's just blow smoke up our ass. He wasn't good. He didn't have it. It's just so tiring. The Yankees could literally get no hit, and the first thing out of Aaron Boone's mouth was, we had competitive at-bats. Well, they have almost gotten no hit in the last two years several times, and he did say that. He'll say there was a lot of good tonight, despite the fact we weren't able to muster anything. We had some traffic, a lot, put a lot of balls on the, on the net. That's what he loves to say, put a lot of balls on the net when they're fouling straight back. But the whole Balls like, on the net? Was that like a <laughs> yeah, like he, fall straight back? Yeah, like that's what he thinks is good. Good swing, um, good swings. Yeah, but, I mean, the other day he said it's it's all right in front of us. And it's the same thing he has said in July and August of the last three years. He said it a little earlier each time in the last three years, but that's all he said. If you go back to last August, Carlos Rodon, they asked him about it. He said it's all in front of us. said the same thing his manager says. When they asked Harrison Bader last year when they were four and a half games out of a playoff spot, Meredith Morakov had said, are you concerned that you're four and a half games out of the last playoff spot? And he said, no concern. No, he wasn't concerned. Chad Green, when he blew a game a few years ago, they asked him about it. He said, well, you just got to come back and get him tomorrow. Aaron Judge always talks about, oh, you know, we got to come back, play better tomorrow. There's always tomorrow for these Yankees, like you said. They, they, they have grown under Boone into this comfortable with losing culture. And, the, you know, the idea that Girardi wasn't brought back because Cashman was afraid that his tense tendencies would wear off on the roster. Well, Boone's tendencies haven't just worn off on them they've become him they are little versions of him they spout the same bullshit that he says you listen to anthony volpe last week uh you know after the weird play where he didn't hustle he didn't know where the ball was didn't run home it it was almost as if boone scripted his answers to the media for him that's what's going on here He, he has created this culture that's like everything is fine we'll always have tomorrow but they're gonna run out of tomorrows and the idea it's all in front of them for the division that could be over this weekend because if they don't win the series this weekend, they only have three games left with the Orioles. They will no longer control their own destiny in terms of the division. So we'll, we can cross that off the list of Boone's nonsense if they don't have a good weekend. And, you know, if they don't have a good weekend, well, you know, we're going to go home. We're going to take this break. We're going to come back, reset. That's what they'll be selling you in the next freaking week till next Friday is that the All-Star break came at the perfect time for them to get some, you know, rest, relaxation, see the family, and then they'll come back in the second half, you know, less than a half, and, and play better. But it's all nonsense. You're exactly right. They act as if they're the 2000 Yankees coming off three championships in the last four years. And it's like, no, no, we got this. Yeah, the 2000 Yankees, when they struggled in the second half of that season, give them the benefit of the doubt, okay, because they're, they're champions. This team has won jack shit. No benefit of the doubt. There's no we always have tomorrow. Like, try and have a sense of urgency to snap out of it and, and try and get through this tough stretch to get to August, which is a soft schedule. Get to that point where you haven't buried yourself in in July, but they're burying themselves. Yeah, and I mean the 2000 Yankees, yeah, they got the benefit of the doubt that they could flip the switch because they did flip the switch. Postseason started, it was like, these are the Yankees from the last three years. They're back, and they won again. Boone, after the 2021 wildcard loss, sat in Fenway Park and with a straight face said that the league has closed the gap on the Yankees. Like, he believes like he as if they were the best team in baseball yeah he acts with this swagger like that he's part of this dynastic run and that they've won a bunch under him when they haven't won anything under him they've never people point out what's that people love to point out with boone he's won the most games ever as manager in his first seven seasons or like it's i don't know if it's ever but it's one of the most ever regular season wins like you can take regular season wins and shove them up your ass this during his tenure is the least competitive the major leagues have ever been like you have like five-ish teams that are really good and then a couple mediocre teams who may have a chance if they get in and then just absolute shit teams tanking not meeting pay like not doing everything they can to win 
you know, the first couple of years of him on the job, he had he got to play 19 games against the Orioles every year. That was 17 yeah. wins a year. So he was just banking wins against a team that was not trying because they wanted to do what they've done now and put together a roster of all top three picks for, you know, half of a decade. So I, I, I can't stand when people use that. Any person could do the job he's done in the regular season. Any person, because there's going to be – a lot of times where the offense, when healthy in past years, goes off and beats the crap out of number four and number five starters. That's going to happen a lot of times over 162 games because there's not 30 teams, you know, there's not enough starting pitching in the world to have 30 teams have five capable starters. But when you get close games, when you get one run, two run games, when a, when a handful of decisions have to be made late in games and he has to put his hands on the games, it turns into a disaster. And that's the problem with him. It's I don't care about his regular season win total. I don't care that he's buddies with everyone. I don't care that he's this friendly guy you want to hang out with. He's not good at his job. And the people who say, oh, if, well, if you get rid of him, who are you going to hire? Well, th they hired so – look what they did last time. They just went out and found someone with no experience. It's very easy to find someone with managerial experience who could do a better job than him. He's had seven years to do a better job, and he hasn't done a better job. I don't know what more people could want – or C to be like, this guy's not right for the job. And yes, he's not the problem. The problem is Brian Cashman and his front office that keeps building these rosters. But Aaron Boone is certainly a problem and he's not part for of the sure. solution. It's time to start making changes. Like to, to, to have to be able to run it back this many times with the same coaching staff and the same essential core of players is really remarkable. No, it, it's the fact that they – I like I said to you earlier this week, I lost all hope after they didn't make changes last year that they're ever going to make changes. Like, th Because if they fizzle out this year, whether they make the playoffs and lose or just barely miss the playoffs, they're going to do the same thing they did in 2022 and look at the success from the season and say that was our true potential, so this team just needs a, one or two tweaks for next year and we're going to run it back and do the same crap. The next thing yeah. I want to talk to you about, though, from a negative is like legit why does Nestor Cortez suck so much on the road and, and he's so good at home he's got a 1.8 ERA at home and a 6 ERA on the road it's it's I cannot figure this out <laughs> I don't think anyone can or they would have fixed it I mean it's not like you know after Rodon's crap he started the other day Boone said that Matt he was like Matt and the pitching guys you know they'll they'll figure it out you know they'll try some new stuff I don't know what you would try besides like what are you gonna have like Tonkin open Rodon starts and then have Rodon come in the second inning? Like, what are we doing here? You're paying the guy 162 million dollars. You can't start. Um, but with Cortez, I don't know. Maybe he just has some comfort level on the mound at Yankee Stadium that he clearly doesn't have on the road because he has a sub two ERA at home and a six something on the road. It doesn't make any sense. It's not like this has been an issue for him in the past either. It's like this no. weird year where it's happening. So. I don't know. I don't know what you do to fix it, but if this team does get to the postseason, he has to pitch games one or two if they're at home yeah. because you cannot trust this guy on the road. I don't. I mean, right now it's, it seems silly talking about lining up a playoff rotation right now, but I agree with you. I mean, Cole's going to start game one. Hopefully, he's better by then and healthy. Yeah. Assuming assuming you're home, it has to be Nestor game two. Who who the hell do you throw game three? It's probably Stroman. Yeah. Heel. But you really, you have to like. You want Marcus Stroman out there nibbling with eighty nine and you know against a playoff team. I mean, okay, it's but it's not Rodon. Rodon's not starting a game. I mean, they really they really want him to because they're paying him to do that. But I mean, you're you also to, paying yeah. Stroman you know a ton of money. Off, like you have the idea that like even if he's missing his spots, like he can still make mistakes and get away with it. Marcus Stroman, if he's not on the black exactly it's the balls in the gap or leaving the park so like you can't trust him rodon's an utter disaster even if rodon like went lights out the rest of the way i still wouldn't trust that guy i'm I never mean, gonna made, trust him he made one playoff start for the white Sox a few years ago against the astros and didn't get through the third inning so you know the guy is not a big game pitcher he's not even a game pitcher so i don't know what you do i i, I mean let's i guess worry about that if, if they are even lucky enough to get there at this point yeah, Nestor's had two good starts on the road this season at the Angels and at Kansas City. Both of those teams don't count. Yeah, I mean, the Angels are are horrific. Um, 
and the Royals have, you know, these really weird spurts where they just, like, can't do anything. And, I mean, the majority of that's because their lineup is, like, Bobby Witt and Perez and, at times, Pascatino and then nothing. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to put a lot of stock into those two starts. Today we are brought to you by Dewar Jeans. My personal favorite pair of jeans by far are my Dewar Jeans. They're very versatile. You can dress them up or down. They're so comfortable that a lot of times I forget that I'm even wearing jeans and they fit great. No matter how many times I have washed these jeans, which doesn't have to be a lot because they're very durable uh, and also their material means that you don't have to wash it as much. But even when I do wash them, they come out fitting the same way that they went in and that's super important. Dewar makes stretch performance denim and lifestyle apparel that's built for doing. They combine comfort with style and quality for all that we do in a day. You can go to work in these jeans. You can go on a date. You can just lounge around the house. You can travel, run errands, whatever you want to do. Dewar jeans are made for all activities. Plus, they're made with sustainable materials like wood chips, plants, and recycled plastic bottles, and they're designed to last. This is a brand that I am very proud to be supporting. Dewar will be your favorite pair of jeans as well. Order yours today. You can check out Dewar's flagship stores in LA or Denver, or you can shop online at shopdewar.com slash Bronx. Right now, listeners can get 20% off site-wide when you use our URL, shopdoer.com slash Bronx. That is spelled D-U-E-R, shopdoer.com slash Bronx. This is an amazing deal. Don't wait. 20% off shopdoer.com slash Bronx. I'm excited that we are also brought to you by a new product from Timeline Nutrition called MitoPure. I've kind of just accepted getting old and feeling tired is just something that's a part of life and it's unavoidable. But Timeline Nutrition says, no, you should not accept feeling old and tired. Timeline is a Swiss-based life science company and a global leader in Urothlin A research. You might not know what this is, so I'm going to tell you. Urothlin A is a powerful postbiotic that is nearly impossible to get from your regular diet alone. Mudopure is clinically shown to give our cellular energy generators new power by triggering the body's natural process for removing and rebuilding damaged mitochondria. The analogy they use is Mitopure is like little Pac-Man going through your cells, chomping up the damaged mitochondria that makes you feel old and tired, and recycling it into new and healthy ones. I've been taking this product for like two weeks at this point, and I'm definitely feeling the effects a little bit more energetic, just a little bit more pep in my step. Mitopure is the number one doctor-recommended Dorothon A supplement that is NSF and Clean Label Project Certified. If you want to give this product a try for yourself, Timeline is offering 10% off your first order order of MitoPure. Go to timeline.com slash Bronx for 10% off. Once again, timeline.com slash Bronx to get this deal. And I already mentioned the next thing is just the awful at bats from the Yankees in the first inning, but then the ninth inning as well. You've get you got two guys on, one out for judge, and he pops out into foul territory. And then Rice does get a single to make it five to four, but I know you're making this point in our text chat. Like, Glaber never has an approach at the plate. It's always just – he's always just winging it up there, so he swings at two balls ends up popping out on a, that weird play to end the game, which was definitely a catch. The he, that def, I know the Yankees were calling for him dropping the ball, but they, no, that was definitely a catch. But Judge not coming through there. Like, it's unfair to, to crap on Judge because he was so hot for two straight months, but he's been cold the last week or so. I'm going to talk about Soto in a second, but when your lineup is basically just two guys, Judge and Soto, and those guys don't come through for you in a game, you are going to lose. So yeah. I don't think it's unfair to point to Judge and say you had two big opportunities in that game on Thursday. The first inning with second and third, and you flew out to right field. Whether that should have been a sack fly or not, who knows, but you flew out, and then you popped out with two runners on in the ninth inning. Judge, you need to come through in one of those two spots if the Yankees are going to win a game. If not, they're going to lose. Yeah, and I mean, it's unfair because Judge had, like, Ruthian numbers for two months, and it's baseball. You can't expect the same person to do the job every single day for six months. Uh, it's very unfortunate that his cold streak is going at this time where the starting pitching sucks and no one else is hitting. Like, this is the time when they need him to have one of those insane runs, and he's just not. Um, so it's tough to get mad. I'm more, I'm more upset about the first inning at bat than I am the ninth inning at bat because – you know, Fairbanks has struggled at times this year, but he's still, you know, really good. Uh, Shane Baz made one start this year. He hasn't pitched in the league in two years because of injuries. That's a guy, like, that's that that run has to get in from third. Like, I'm sorry, but th- that makes me more upset to not get the early lead there against a guy who's 
only had one start in two years who could easily spiral if things didn't go right in the first and you don't get the job done. To me, that, that was a much you know, worse situation for him than what happened in the ninth. But Glaber, yeah, no plan at the plate. I mean, Glaber is given golden opportunities. He Fairbanks misses with the first two pitches. He's ahead 2-0. and So now you're ahead 2-0. and Pick a zone, and if you get the ball there, drive it. Instead, he gets a fastball in the dirt and swings at it. Now he's 2-1. He eventually gets ahead 3-1, then swings at a, a fastball high out of the zone. So now it's 3-2, and then it's Glaber, and with 3-2, he's not going to do anything. So I don't know how many more chances he could get to have hitters counts and be in these great situations and just not come through, but it's gone on long enough with him that it's hard to expect him to come through in any situation. I, I have no faith in Glaber. If the Yankees acquire an infielder at the deadline, like – you know, Heyman's talking about the Yankees. I've had conversations with Miami about uh, Jazz Chisholm. Does Glaber sit? Does DJ sit? Is it just a rotation of those two guys because both have been awful? Like, I'm I'm totally done with Glaber. If I never see him play another game for the Yankees, I'm I'm fine with that. I'm I'm done trying to bank on him turning things around. There's a zero percent chance Glaber sits. If Brian Cashman on Tuesday in Tampa said. They asked him about Glaber, and he said last year he was the best hitter on the team aside from Judge, and they're waiting for him to become that player again. So he's going to wait it out. He'll wait it out until the game 161. He will not sit Glaber Torres. So if they get an infielder, it doesn't matter who it is, Glaber's still going to play. Great. <laughs> well, Juan Soto doesn't seem healthy because the Yes Network has to make it a point of zooming in on every single time he swings and grimaces. It happened a couple times this series. Boone said he's been getting treatment on both his hand and his forearm. He did have a good game on Thursday with a double and a home run, but but he was basically hitting in the low 200s with no power since he missed the games against the Dodgers with the forearm injury in early June. Um, overall, though, since then, his numbers are 239 with a 451 on base percentage because he's still amazing and still walks a lot, 443 slugging. But for the most part, he hasn't really looked great offensively. So I don't think he's healthy, and he's just playing through it. But what do you think? Well, Meredith asked Boone on Thursday night about Soto and if he's just if it's something that's pain tolerance or if it's possible that he's playing and could do more damage to it. And Boone said if he could be, do more damage to it, he wouldn't be playing, which we know isn't true because the Yankees play people with post-concussion syndrome and broken bones and torn ligaments all the time. So that was just a wild thing for Boone to say. But... I think, you know, Soto's not healthy. Every time he swings and misses, he grimaces, grabs his arm, and it looks like he broke or tore something. Um, but he's in, he's in a contract here. He knows he has to play. If he sits out, it's going to hurt his wallet come the end of the year, and he's looking to be the highest paid player ever. So I think it's, you know, Juan Soto thinking, hey, if I'm at 70% or 60%, that's still better than nearly everyone in this league, so I'll just deal with it and play through it. And, you know, we're seeing it. Yeah, the power hasn't been there. He's hit, like, a couple home runs in the last month. Um, you know, he's still walking because he has the best eye in the game, and he's, he's still getting on base. He's had a few hits last night. But, yeah, he doesn't look like the same player when before this happened. And uh, I guess it's just something that you're going to have to deal with. He said he's going to play in the All-Star game anyway, uh, so it's not like he's getting the next week off. Uh, so just hope for the best and hope it doesn't get worse or the fact that he has to come out of the lineup because if he comes out of the lineup – if he or Judge come out of the lineup, just, like, pack up the bats and balls, and, and we'll see you in March. I agree. Like, if it was a season-ending injury, that would hurt his free agency. But if it's a month-long injury and then he comes back in the middle of August and is good the rest of the way, no one's going to even care about that. So that's why I'm kind of surprised, like, Boris isn't encouraging him, hey, just go on the IL and get this back to 100% and then come back and be good for the last six weeks of the season. Now, to Soto's credit, he never wants to miss a game. Like, I love that about him. He kicks He's down Boone's door. He's the anti-Yankee. Well, the Yankees will slowly beat the Yankee into him. But uh, he kicks down Boone's door 15 minutes before the game and says, put me in the lineup. Like, I want that mentality from, from the superstar. But it might only be a matter of time before he's like, well, I, I, I'm only going to grimace and swing and miss so many times before this isn't worth it. Right. And like last week he was scratched and then right before the game, they put him in the lineup. How many times ever, if ever, has someone under Boone been like, they're not playing and then all of a sudden they are playing? I mean, there's only one other time I can think about is when Herman wasn't going to pitch last year and then came in and then was, you know, basically it was the last game he ever pitched because he went crazy after it. But 
that's just something that one person on the team would do. Yeah, that's a, it's a good, I don't know. I think, you know, they made up their mind. I think they had a plan last when that, whatever that was, that was in Toronto, right? Where he sat the Saturday game and Monday was an off day. So everyone just assumed he wasn't going to play on Sunday. And that was the Yankees plan. And Soto went in and changed that. So obviously like Soto's calling the shots there. Boone's not calling the shots. Right. Which makes you think at times when they're like, oh, Judge wants to play, but he's not playing. It's like, well, does he want to play? Soto wanted to play and he played. Yeah. It's a, no, that's a good point. Um, all right, a couple mailbag questions that we, we got that um, we haven't done mailbags in a few weeks because uh, we were holding them, but if we don't do them now, they're not going to be relevant. So you guys can submit your mailbag questions, info at bronxpinstripes.com, and then when Scott's back next week, we'll, we'll get to more mailbags. First one <clears throat> is from John. Sup, guys? Just wrapped up listening to the Mets podcast. I think the instability and poor management conversation around Glaber Torres stems from trading Gio Urshela rather than Torres. I was a Gio guy when they traded him instead of Torres. I was broken and asked myself, what the hell did they just do? They could have kept Gio at third base and DJ would be the second baseman. He probably wouldn't have been hurt when he went down and we'd still have our non-injured DJ. So, John from Westchester feels that they should have kept Gio Urshela and moved on from Glaber Torres. I mean, the the love people had for Gio Urshela eventually started to annoy me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that trade just shouldn't have happened. Period. It was it was the it was the Yankees wanting to not have Sanchez anymore, and it was their odd love and infatuation with Kiner Falefa that led to that deal. So. The deal was a disaster because he ended up paying Donaldson 50 something million and then you had to pay him to not play this season. He was awful. Um, you know, Ben Rortvet was a non factor for the Yankees and now he's with Tampa having good at bats, it seems like every time he plays against the Yankees. Um, so it didn't really matter to me. Like, you know, Gio, he was, he had his moments as a Yankee. He was, he was a solid Yankee given, you know, his talent level and ability. But that was just a, a trade that should have never happened in the first place. So it, it, it angers me that the trade did happen, um, all to get Kiner Falefa, which is just still crazy to me. Like, Texas was willing to give a half a billion dollars to Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager so they wouldn't have to play Kiner Falefa. Sent him to the Twins. He was there for 10 seconds, and they were like, well, let's get rid of this guy because the Yankees are willing to take $50 million of Donaldson so that we could pay Correa. Like, the Yankees just helped everybody out in that sense and hurt themselves. And then it's funny because he was supposed to be the stopgap to Volpe, and now Volpe is, like, I can't watch Volpe play baseball. That's how bad he is. It's, it's infuriating to watch a guy play with no consequences for how bad he can be, given unlimited chances. He sits in the middle of the lineup, the top of the lineup, the bottom of the lineup. He's there every single day, no matter how bad he is. No one else gets that kind of leash unless they're owed $200 million. The Volpe thing is is interesting because there's a perception he's been much better than he was last year, and that's just not true. He's basically been worse than last year because right. no people, power. Are po people are pointing to, like, oh, he's getting more hits. Look at his batting average. Okay, so you're saying you'd rather have a, a 250 singles hitter than a 220 hitter that at least can hit 20 home runs? Like, both are not great, but 250 singles hitter is essentially the – a Hard, the worst type of offensive player you can have in modern baseball. And if right. you throw out the first 10 games of the season, which I know is unfair because you can't take away games that actually happened. But if you just take, if you look at like the middle of April till now, he's been actually far worse than he was last year. I think the, if you go from like his forehead game against Arizona and you remove the games before that, kind of like what you just said, I'm pretty sure his WRC plus is two points lower than last year. So he's actually been worse than last year outside of that first Houston and Arizona series. But in that Houston and Arizona series, I was stunned at how good he looked at the plate. It was like whatever he did in the offseason, like this guy is the real deal. He was he had discipline. Like he was taking pitches just off the off the zone. He was fouling off anything in the zone that he couldn't drive. And then when he did get something to drive, he was he was taking walks. He was stealing bases. I was like, this is a fucking superstar. And it lasted for a week. And then he went right back to the old guy from last year who sucks. I have no idea what he did in that first week of the season. It was unbelievable. And then to go right back to what he used to be, 
I don't know what he was doing then, but how could that last such a little time? I mean, we saw brief glimpses of it last year. Never as good as we saw to start the season this year, but you saw him go on a couple of two, three hot streaks last season that everyone's like, oh, there's the potential that he's flashing. That's the reason why his he was touted as a top top 30 Major League Baseball prospect or whatever he was, and his bat was, was uh, the reason he got through the minor leagues. And then, yeah, the hot streak to start this season, I think he went on a little – when he had that hit streak – um, I think he also yeah. didn't have like a 20 something game history or whatever it was. Uh, that was another one this year, but I think you said, la- uh, what was it? His last home run was like the middle of May. Yeah. May 16th. So May he's 16th. been a home run in two months. He, he doesn't walk and because he doesn't get on base, he can't steal. So, you know, he has a cell, he has like a 200 on base percentage over the last two months. I mean, that's unplayable numbers. And if you want to say, oh, well, his defense and he's a positive war yeah. guy, his, his whole war is based on his defense. You can go find someone to play a defensive shortstop and can't hit. Those guys grow on trees. Yep. You can't find the all-around Sign package. those guys for one and a half million bucks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, he gets treated by a large faction of the fan base. Like, he's Gunnar Henderson or Bobby Witt. Like, those guys are super-duper stars. Volpe isn't even close to being a star. In a 1,000 career plate appearances, he has like a 680 OPS right now. That's... That's really, really bad when that's you basically bet your entire future middle infield on him not being that. And that's what makes it so bad. Isn't just that he's bad. It's that he was their top prospect. He was the guy that was untouchable in any trade. He was the reason they didn't sign any of the top free agent shortstops over the past couple seasons because he was going to be an all-star for the next decade. Right. And I know it's still only a year and a half of him, but I don't see him being an all-star for the next decade. I don't see that. You've seen it for a week, like you said. You can't right. be good for seven days in April and 12 days in May and be an all-star, okay? That's just not how it works. No, and I mean, the problem is also like he is the golden boy within the organization, so... Cashman, when he makes these like decisions where he's like putting his legacy on the line decisions, like with Boone, he'll never get rid of Boone. With Hicks, it took like Hicks basically quitting on the team on the field for him to no longer be part of the team. With, you know, there's so many uh, things you could think of with Cashman, you know, having an all right handed lineup. He'll, he'll, he's so stubborn, he thinks that like eventually he will be right. I can't think of a time when someone was just awful and Cashman was like, we're going to wait it out, wait it out, and eventually worked out. It doesn't necessarily eventually ever work out for them. So it's hard to believe that Volpe is going to turn into a star because the Yankees have a real problem finishing off the development of players. And last year made sense because coming off the year before, they wanted to give the fans something good. They didn't have an answer at shortstop. Kiner Falefa wasn't it. He had an awesome spring training. He lit up AAA in his limited time there. It was like, okay, we're going to give him the opportunity. But he did enough last year to be like, he may need to get sent down and to work on things. And they didn't do it. And now at this point, you can't do it. So he's just going to be given this unlimited leash. And, you know, he's hurting the team because they put so much stock into him becoming a star that, like, now him being a zero in the lineup is a real problem. It's not like last year where you can say, oh, let's hit him ninth and let him figure it out because you can't rely on the kid, let everyone else hit, and then whatever he gives you is a bonus. This year he was going to be counted on to be a part of the offense, and he hasn't been at all. I mean, he was the leadoff hitter up until a week and a half ago when they were like, okay, I guess Ben Rice, you can, you can be the leadoff hitter. Oh, Verdugo, I guess you can be. The, right. Literally, they'll throw anyone in the leadoff spot now just to see if that shit sticks. Right, and if Rizzo never got hurt, he'd still be batting lead off or cleanup or something, and Rice would still be in the minors and no one would know his name. 100% that the only reason Ben Rice is in the majors is because Rizzo got hurt. They'd still be suffering through Rizzo's 590 OPS and yeah. quest, like mind-bogglingly boggling, ridiculous defense where he would just boot <laughs> easy ground balls for or no just, reason like, pick up a grounder and then stand there when the pitcher doesn't run and cover and just let the guy be safe like that happened a handful of times booting routine grounders like you know it's i don't know how you he comes back and you say like you're the guy again like ben rice has done enough where even if he falls off you'd still be like rizzo's not playing well it's 70 plate appearances of ben rice and he's got whatever eight 
90 OPS, which is very good, but it is 70 plate appearances. Right. And everyone's like, oh, this is the future first base. I'm like, why are we giving the benefit of the doubt to the Yankees player development that this is the yeah. guy? Like, like they've there's been so many want, guys who this was the guy. If you even want to give them credit for Aaron Judge, which <laughs> let's be he had his own hitting coach. But you, do you know who also has Aaron Judge's hitting coach? Ben Rice. Well, there you go. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we're not 100 percent on that, but we we think very strongly that uh, when we talk to the to Rich uh, Richard, uh, the hitting coach for for Judge, he referred to another player who was in Double A. We thought it was Spencer Jones, but it, I think it's probably Ben Rice. <laughs> another credit to Soto is everyone's like, "Oh, Ben Rice, young kid." This Ben Rice is the same age as Juan Soto, which is absurd. <laughs> I know. Like, that's how like Soto. You think he's like thirty three years old, Ben? Like, <laughs> the kid's twenty five years old. And, like insane. he's the same age as Ben Rice. That's yeah. that's ins- and the fact that like they may not have him after this year. Every time I watch him, it just it just is, it makes me sad. Like after every game ends, it's like another game off the schedule that Soto's a Yankee. Well, <laughs> the countdown of Glaber Torres offsets that for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's true but you know glaber you know he'll be a seattle mariner next year and come to the stadium and be like six for seven in a series yeah. with three home runs i think i said this on, i don't remember if i said this on your show or uh, last episode but chicago white Sox. he's going to be the best chicago white Sox signing in the last decade <laughs> he's not going to get a lot of money because i think ben and no. they gave 75 mil to the highest the ever money they ever gave to someone now, the, Glaber will sign like a two-year deal with like a with a club option or like a vesting option if he you know has certain number of plate appearances or something like that. Yeah, he'll 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 come back to haunt the Yankees. Don't you worry. All right, next one is from Simon, who is an Aussie Yankees fan living in Sydney. He says, "Surely the amount of injury-prone players the Yankees have, it's time to draw a line in the sand with young players who seem to routinely pick up injuries and move on from them." I'd love to see Jason Dominguez in the Bronx and contributing, but I think he's more valuable as a trade piece at this point. Thoughts? I mean, is Dominguez even a, a trade chip at this deadline, considering he hasn't been able to really play baseball for a calendar year? Yeah, I mean, I love Dominguez. I was, you know, I thought he the moment he was healthy, he should have been on the team, like, he shouldn't have been put, you know, I get it. He didn't have a lot of triple A time. They wanted to rehab him, not rush him the typical Yankee way, but he did enough, whether it was eight games or whatever last year to be more deserving than a lot of the guys in the lineup. But you know um, why the reason he, he wasn't put on the team? Cause at the time Stanton was healthy and yeah. Verdu- and Verdugo, and Verdugo they weren't awesome, going to take right? Verdugo out of the lineup. They had like Verdugo was so bad and people thought he was just going to like flip this switch. Like this is who he is. He's a, slightly below league average hitter to league average hitter is his ceiling and then he'll give you good defense but most of the time he's just going to hit the ball on the ground to second base i mean that's who he is so dominguez like the injury couldn't have come at a worse time i mean it was it was heartbreaking when he got hurt last year because he was the only reason to watch those games at the end of the year and once it was a week of games it was literally a week of games but like the only time you'd i'd I'd watch him bat and then i would just come back when i knew he was going to be up again that was it and then once he was gone it was like who cares but how about that guy who wrote the question i just googled what time is it in sydney and it's midnight so this guy is like sacrificing crazy weird hours to watch the yankees and it's like (laughs) maybe he watches on replay or something yeah, I mean, good for him because we watch a normal time and it's it's painful. Unbearable. <laughs> it's yeah, unbearable. So like, if they're playing at seven p.m., I guess that's nine a.m. at Sydney. So he wakes up and starts his day like watching Rodon give up four runs in ten <laughs> seconds. Like that's a horrible way to start your day. He can uh, he can have it with his. I don't know what do Aussies eat for breakfast. I I did travel to Australia a number of years ago. I don't remember the food though. I remember there was a uh, Vegemite. I remember that, which is taste like salty dog shit but how about scotch is being in italy like missing this whole spiral like living the yeah. life he, he probably doesn't even know what's happening he's gonna come back and be like he hasn't texted in our group chat in yeah, a while he's gonna come back and be like what what went on <laughs> or he'll just be like yeah this makes sense yeah probably more more like that but I, I miss when, when they won 50 games, when they got first to 50 games and people were celebrating. First to 50 wins, first, they're at 56 wins. They're going to hang that, they're gonna hang that banner next, yeah. to the, next to the best record through June uh, 1st of 2022 banner. <laughs> that was a month ago, and they're at 56 wins now. <laughs> 
for last to 60 wins first to 50 <laughs> last to 60 it could happen i mean they're basically playing at a colorado rockies pace right now so <laughs> all right you got one more question another i mean we've got international audience here hey guys it's tim from spain i just wanted to tell you a story of my time as an eight-year-old baseball player whilst at an american school in singapore so this guy living in spain and he was at an american school in singapore said i was pretty good every time i made contact i rounded the bases until one day i didn't i hit the ball and it was caught left field probably as i was a little pull happy so i was out but i refused to move the umpire ev everyone else told me to get back to the dugout i started screaming and i continued screaming until the umpire let me have another go and that time I scored. So that was really good lesson learned. Appalling, spoiled brats will always succeed in the end. I'm looking at you, Carlos. Keep up the good work. Tim from Spain. <laughs> well, here's another guy. I just it's Spain is six hours ahead. So most times That's worse than Australia this though. This guy because... has to watch one AM Yankees baseball. Like you are sacrificing you're depriving yourself of sleep, like the most important thing you need as a human being besides like food and water, and to watch this team is that's that's crazy. That's crazy. I don't know. I, I don't think you can function as an adult in Europe watching American baseball. You have you can't watch games from one a.m. until six a.m. or four a.m. every day. Yeah. You have I to mean, just I, watch these on replay. You must not have kids either, because as someone who has kids, like when they go to the West Coast and I stay up late, like I, it takes me three weeks to get my life back in order after they. After they well, go you back actually stay up late and watch them, though. I don't. It, it depends. Like if Rodon's starting, I don't have to stay up that late. Like it's. I get, you know, I'll be, the game's at 10.05, it's over by 10.17 if Rodon starts, so it's not that bad. Um, but yeah, Rodon is a spoiled brat. He, I mean, the guy got $162 million based off of one healthy season. He happened to have the only healthy season of his career, the year as he was an impending free agent. So of course the Yankees were like, well, let's go get this guy because he had one year healthy. He's likely to continue to be healthy as he, you know, gets to 30 and on the other side of 30, as the data shows, Baseball players, as they age, typically get better over time, especially once they get on the other side of 30. So let's give them $162 million. Because the Yankees watched. I don't know how you watch what happened in the second half of 2022 and how they lost to the Astros and think we are a starting pitcher away from closing a four-win gap in the playoffs against the Astros. But that's what they did. They went out and gave all their money to Rodon. Then Hal Steinbrenner signed Rodon and told Judge, we're not done yet. And then they were done. And then they, that was it. And then they stunk last year, missed the playoffs. Worst season in 30 years. Can't make the playoffs when 40% of the team makes the playoffs. Come back this year, trade for Soto, but just completely just say, we don't need a bullpen. We're so smart, we can make everybody great. Give us any reliever and we'll make them great. And that didn't work out. And the lineup stayed the same. And we're in the same spot as we were a year ago. Another collapse. Yep. Well, don't worry. They're just going to go out and get a first baseman. And a second baseman, and a third baseman, and a catcher, and a starting pitcher, and three bullpen yeah. arms at the deadline, and they'll yeah. be good. The Very team will easy be fixed. To do. Especially when yeah. like twenty-one teams are kind of in the race, it's going to be a real easy thing, and you won't have to pay well, a lot to do it. Brian Cashman even said that, so you know what that means is they're, they're going to get they're, they're going to the get one reliever. Good. Yeah, they're going to get one reliever at the deadline. Right. Say they were in the mix on a ton of guys, but the price just didn't make sense. And that they've got Stanton coming back and these other guys coming back, Efros coming back, and DJ needs to turn it around, and Glaber needs yeah. to turn it around. And those are going to be their, their acquisitions. The team is likely going to continue to stumble. We'll probably make the playoffs just because of the cushion that they built up. Obviously, if they continue on this recent win streak, they're not making the playoffs. But they'll probably play 500 ball from here on out or something like that, make yep. the playoffs, get absolutely embarrassed in the playoffs again, run it back next year. <laughs> well, I told you two days ago it was the happy 14th anniversary of Cashman not trading for <laughs> yeah. Cliff Lee, and all, all Seattle wanted was Eduardo Nunez or Ivan Nova, and he said, a real quote, it was too much to give up for a rental. Eduardo Nunez, four years later, they released him in spring training and gave his roster spot to Yanervis Solarte, who then Nunez made the play to save the ALDS in 2018 for the Red Sox against the Yankees and then hit a home run in the World Series against the Dodgers and became a champion. The honors of Nerva already flamed out. The Yankees eventually gave up on Nova, sent him to Pittsburgh for nothing. And, you know, they could have won a second straight World Series that year. So that's what we're going to get this. We're going to hear 
the price is too much. They're not going to part with anything. But at the same time, like, unless you do what you just said and get all these pieces, what's one piece going to do? Like going and trading for Jazz, what's that going to get you? That's not, gonna, that's not putting this team over the top. And we're 19 days away. Heyman's saying they're, inve- they're interested in Jazz. I'm sure everyone is. Like, yeah. it, 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 it's not like they're going to make a move for the Orioles series. This isn't going to happen for three more weeks. And by then, who knows what their record will be. No, it's – acquiring a bullpen arm or Jazz Chisholm is trying to put out a forest fire with a garden hose. That's all it is. Yeah, it's like we're just doing something to do something. Like, yeah, he, he makes them better because he's better than what they have. But going from this disastrous 25-game stretch, putting Jazz in there, he's not he's not changing the course of where they're going. He's got they're a 10 – I was looking up. He's got a 104 OPS plus this year. That's, yeah, he's he's a, a Verdugo. Like, he's that bad. And Verdugo is less than that, but that's like Verdugo's ceiling. So you're going to get a guy who every once in a while pops one out. He's like a guy to, easy guy to root for, fan favorite type, but he's not he's not moving the needle drastically and like making them the the team to beat in the American League, which Vegas still thinks they are. They're still the favorite to win the American League. Like have you watched any games? Are they're they favorite? really? They're they're minus 138 on Friday in Baltimore. Like what? Well, Cole's pitching. <laughs> what year are we in? Cole <laughs> This game means something. Do you think he's going to pitch well? Uh, <clears throat> I, know your, I know your feelings about Cole. I mean, do, do you think he's going to pitch well on Friday? I, I, I don't know because I don't know that he is. We're not, what are we looking at for Cole? What is he at this point? Is he still at the end of his know. ramp up? Is, is this like a 99? Sometimes he throws 91. Then he says he's throwing 91 on purpose. We don't know what his pitch count is. I, I have no idea what to expect from him. I don't either. That's and that's why I'm not confident in saying he's going to pitch well. It's not because, to your point, he only pitches well in meaningless games. Well, <laughs> I mean, tell your me facial the expression says otherwise. I know tell me the, the track record's not good. Well. The record's not on my side for that. I know that. For of all people, I would think that you would be on on the, this side of the line for that argument. Yeah, but it's like, what, what are we arguing about here? Like, I still would... I won the Cy Young in a season in the worst Yankee season in thirty years. He pitched half of the season in games that be, meant nothing. Yeah, meant nothing. And, and you know, September of twenty twenty one, they just needed to win one more game to host the one game playoff, and he lost every game. Whether he was healthy or not, he took the ball. If you take the ball, you're saying you're healthy. Was awful in the one game playoff. Couldn't get Chaz McCormick out in, in game three when I sat next to you. I, you know, sat next to both of you. He, I, I got this. Game. I got this. Base hit. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. So, it's not good. So, I mean. You know, I just can't I, sit here and shit all over Garrett Cole when the rest of the team is a freaking no, I'm dumpster fire. I just, I'm just, I'm not, I, everything I just gave you was a fact. He it is. poorly in those games. I don't. I don't know what to expect. It's like an umpire, like the umpire on Thursday, like he was calling balls high strikes, balls low strikes, but then the next time it wouldn't be a strike. I didn't know every pitch thrown. I didn't know what it was going to be called. That's how I feel with Cole right now. I have no idea what to expect from him. But I do know on Sunday they're losing because Rodon's starting. So now you have to win on Friday and Saturday to win the series because there is no chance that Rodon pitches well on Sunday. No chance. No, when you, no, I, I all you need that. to know is that the Orioles have been shut out the last two games. They have the best offense. So like, that's not going to continue. They're going to explode. Probably going to explode on Friday night. Yeah, but, like, again, to my point with Cole, it's it's as much of he's – is he still rehabbing? What's his pitch count? Is he healthy? That's why I have no confidence he's going to pitch Yeah, we don't well. know. Yeah. Like, is he a four-inning guy? It, he's like a full, I think he's like a five-inning guy at max right now. And when he's healthy, he throws 100 pitches in five innings. So – now you need to get 12 plus outs from a bullpen that stinks like the Red weekend. Sox start was especially painful to watch for him even though the Yankees ended up winning that game in a blowout he had 68 pitches through 3 innings every single batter was 2232 and he just couldn't get swings and misses right and i know the again the Yankees won cuz Ben Rice hit 3 home runs in the game but but that's a didn't the Red Sox, the Red Sox took the lead, I think, in the fourth or fifth inning of that game? Like, if literally, if Ben Rice does not hit three home runs in that game, they're losing that game. Alex Cora and the advanced scouts from that team ruined the Yankee season. 
because prior to that, no one was running on Trevino. No one was like the Red Sox went out and they were like swinging first pitch fastball on every pitcher they saw. Like they went out, did their homework, destroyed the Yankees, gave the rest of the league the book on how to beat them, and everyone's done it since. Like that series in Boston turned the season around between the stealing and their approach at the plate, ruined the starting pitching, and they've never been able to recover. The offense was always a problem. It was, it's always like they had that weekend in Milwaukee where they scored 30 runs in two days. They had all these random games to prop up their run differential. Kansas the, City. Offense is, the offense has always been a problem. It, it'll have these moments where it goes off, like went off in Toronto last week. That, that's going to happen from time to time. That's baseball. But consistently, it was bad. They were, they were held up by the starting pitching. And once Boston exposed that as, like, you can get these guys early in the count, swinging first pitch fastball every time, and then what they did to Trevino, like, ruined his career, basically. Like, it's embarrassing. Everyone's gonna, like, if he plays on – like, Gunnar Henderson gets on base in any of these games to lead off, it's a double. Like, he gets on first, he singles, he walks, it's going to be a double if Trevino's behind the plate. The Orioles will run in them. They've got him, they've got Mateo, they're going to run. And this this weekend is – it's like the perfect storm for the Yankees to get swept and be one in five on this trip going into the all-star break. But the problem is like, it's a good timing because you could make a move. You could make a managerial move and come out of the break clean slate, but they're not going to because they're going to instead use the break and spin it as though it's a break. We need this break right now. And they're going to give you the same team next Friday. And this schedule for them coming out of the break is really bad. It's really bad. It's it's tough after the break, and then it's easy in August. Okay, so if they get swept this weekend, I don't know how – that's not really much of a difference if they just win one out of three. Well, but the division is over then. Yeah, but it, say, it, they it, get, it, say they get swept one and five into the break after this god-awful stretch for a month straight. Who's the fall guy? Yeah. Who's getting fired? Because last year it was the hitting coach. The first the first ball boy to walk by Cashman in the, in the tunnel. I mean, who are they going to fire? Like, they, they got rid of the hitting coach last year, and the offense still sucks. So, like, that didn't do anything. What are you going to do? That was the first midseason change, coaching change he's made in his 26 years as GM. So, to I don't know that he'll just ax the manager, his hand-picked manager that he's defended at every turn. That's the change you have to make. Whether, whether it's going to change anything or not, you cannot get swept this weekend and be losers of what would it be then, like, you would be losers of eight out of your last 28 or something like something crazy like that. Like have not won a series in six weeks at that point. You cannot, you cannot come back next Friday and think that like five days away. It's like in Mrs. Doubtfire when, uh, you know, <laughs> the kid has that, whenever he has the party for his kid and the mom comes home and he's like, and she wants to break up and he's like, why don't we just go on vacation? And she's like, our problems will be waiting for us when we get back. <laughs> Like, that's the like You're going to take a four-day break, and when you come back on Friday, guess what? You have the same fucking team with the same shitty manager. Is Cameron into Mrs. Doubtfire or something, or are you just popping No, but every time on? it's on, my wife will watch it. So I've seen it, like, 7,000 times in my life. Got it. But it's true. It's like, you're just going to take a four. Like, it's almost like the, like people say, oh, how can you compare? Cashman did it the other day. He said the issues with this team are different than the issues last year and the year before when someone asked about the claps being the same. That annoyed the crap out of me. It's the same issues. <laughs> It's different yeah, people, it's different. same issues. With a break, with a Christmas and winter break, but it's this every you can't just like think because the season ends in October and then you start in March that like everything changed. No, you have the same players, the same roster, the same core, the same coaching staff. It's going to be the same result. You can, just because you have a, a couple months off, you're coming back with the same crap. I mean, it's literally the same exact problems as 2022. The team started struggling in 2022 when the starting pitching was not elite, the bullpen got tired, and the lineup was exposed for being top-heavy. That's exactly thing. what's happening right now. There's just different people playing. We are watching 2022 again with, like you yes. said, different names. Different names, same problems. Yeah. Same and exact thing. And they're going to get in the playoffs like they did because they had a huge cushion. And then once they get there, maybe they'll beat a crappy team like they eked by the shitty Cleveland team that year. But then if they see a real team... They're going to be busting out the twenty, the 2004 highlights again for some motivation. <laughs> well, oh God, I forgot about that. Well, isn't it potentially lining up where the Yankees would face the Astros in the first round? I think right now if the season ended, when I looked yesterday, it was, it was the twin. So it's like, okay, well, they're going to win that round. Or not the first round. It wouldn't be the wild card round. It would be the, um, the DS. 
they would play, well, Baltimore and Cleveland would get buys, so they would end up playing one of them. In the DS, they would end up playing them? Because, well, Baltimore and Cleveland would get a bye. Yeah. Then you'd have the West winner playing a wild card team and the Yankees playing another wild card team. Oh, okay, and then the right. two winners of those would play Baltimore and Cleveland. So, okay. you know, if they got I mean, Baltimore. This is, what I'm trying to get at is this is lining up for the Astros to beat them in the playoffs. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Astros are hotter than hot right now. I think they're four games behind the Yankees now. Like, <laughs> they just – and they don't even have Kyle Tucker. And, and they don't even have a pitching staff. If they'll, you go, they'll, do so, they'll do a few things at the deadline. Oh, yeah, 100%. They'll be better. And if you look at – I mean, first of all, that's a team – like the 2000 Yankees where like you got to give them the benefit of the doubt if they get in they'll flip a switch because those guys know how to play when they're there and they know how to win and the fact that they're doing this I mean their bullpen like their big names Presley Hader um they, they were all horrible at the beginning of the season Montero and then you know now they're good the starting pitching is the disaster but they're doing this offensively without Tucker and they don't have Christian Javier, and they don't have McCullers, obviously, and Framber Valdez has been up and down, and Verlander's not himself, and they're still there. And they're going to win that division, and if you get to the playoffs, you're probably going to see them, and they're probably going to kick your ass again. The Yankees basically threw themselves a parade when they swept the Astros four games to start the season. And yeah. Since and they, then... they had like a 5% chance at one point to like win each of those games. like. You know, opening day, they're down four runs late. They're down another day. They've got Soto's throwing a guy out at the plate. Soto's getting an opposite field single off Hater. Volpe's hits a home run. Like, crazy things were happening for them to win those four games. And, you know, it's funny. I remember texting with you during the first opening day being like, this is the same shit, same shit. And then they end up winning. And then all of a sudden, people are like, ooh, this is a new team. This is a different team. And then what happened? We're in mid-July. Same team. <laughs> all right, Neil. Well, thank you so much for joining me. This was Thanks. refreshing, as always, to speak with you about the Yankees. <laughs> hey, um, I mean, it, hopefully it gets better this weekend, but I think it's not going to get better this weekend. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Not- I mean, Baltimore is just a better team than them. So whether Baltimore right. just got swept by the Cubs or not, or they just swept the Cubs, like the fact of the matter is Baltimore is better than the Yankees. So on the road in Baltimore heading into the All-Star break, yeah, no, it's not looking good. No. Not good at all. All right. We'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks for having me on.